My, this is a mutual admiration society tonight. But let me point out the deep gratitude that we have to Kendrick Fraser, because in one profound sense, the skeptical inquirer is the heart of our movement. And his long, hard work over the years has given us a tremendous uh, role and impact in this country and worldwide. This uh, convention has had a good deal of attention in the national media, and I've been looking at the local attention in Seattle, and I shudder at some of the attention, because they seem to uh, often emphasize what I consider the frivolous. One report tonight said uh, that we were debunkers, skeptics, negative critics of uh, ufology. And it's true, of course, we've examined, <laughs> we've examined with great uh, scrutiny uh, the claims of uh, abductions, as we did last night and during uh, today. And we have um, examined over the years, a wide range of claims. I think if you look at the pages of the Skeptical Park, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of claims from psychic phenomena and faith healing and levitation and spontaneous combustion and uh, astrology. I won't read the whole litany because every time I do I get depressed. But <laughs> in any case, all right, fine. So that's our, our role as gadflies uh, to keep alive uh, the sense of critical inquiry in a free market of ideas. It's important uh, that the scientific critics and the skeptics have a role and we there would be a great disservice to this country and indeed throughout the world if only the pro-paranormalists had their say and the, and, the, and the paranormalists are never questioned and so that is our role it's the Socratic mission that we're continuing but we also have a very deep positive role and I think that is often overlooked in that dinner uh, tonight uh, we were remarking about the sense of wonder in science and the sense of awe. Who needs these paranormal fantasies that are spun out of human imagination when, in contrast, the universe itself is so exciting? And particularly as one launches into outer space and probes the vast universe and also into inner space, uh, into life forms. It's that positive aspect. And our speaker tonight, Carl Sagan, surely stands out as one of the leading proponents of the scientific outlook and the scientific method. He's Mr. Cosmos, as we know, because of the cosmic vision. And science does have, I don't like the term vision, it's a quotation mark every time I use it, but there is a cosmic outlook that science provides. And it competes with the metaphysical and the spiritual and the paranormal views of the universe. Carl Sagan is truly a Leonardo man of thought and action. Has that term been used to describe you, Carl? But it's really true. A, Le a Leonardo man because you've accomplished in so many fields. Professor of Astronomy and Space Sciences and Director of the Laboratory for Planetary Studies at Cornell University. You also played a leading role in the Mariner, Viking, Voyager, and Galileo spacecraft expeditions to the planets. Carl Sagan is known for his work on the massive greenhouse effect on Venus, windblown dust as the explanation of the seasonal changes on Mars, the early faint sun paradox, the organic aerosols on Titan, the origin of life, and the long-term consequences of nuclear war on Earth. But he's performed so many other tasks beyond the academic. He served as chairman of the Division of Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society, president of the planetology section of the American Geophysical Union, and chairman of the astronomy section of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And for 12 years, he was editor-in-chief of Icarus, the leading professional journal devoted to planetary research. He's also co-founder and president of the Planetary Society. Dr. Sagan is author and co-author or editor 
of more than 20 books. His most recent books with Ann Drynan, his wife who is here today, is Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, A Search for Who We Are. And there are two more in the offing, one next year and one the following spring. And I don't remember the names, but they seem very exciting indeed. And of course, his great television series, Cosmos, became the most widely watched series in the history of public television. Dr. Sagan received the Pulitzer Prize and he will receive tomorrow night the Isaac Asimov Award from the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. I think that we can say that his major contribution today is that he is in the public mind worldwide the leading exponent of the scientific outlook and the scientific method and that in a very positive sense. He's not simply a critic of the pseudosciences from astrology to ufology, but he's defending the profound role that science has or should have in world civilization, and there is often an insufficient appreciation for that. Now we in PSYCOP are very grateful that he's been a long-standing supporter, that uh, over the years he has, in his writings and in his talks, constantly talked about the need for a skeptical inquiry. It is a great pleasure indeed to introduce to you as our keynote speaker, Dr. Carl Sagan. Thank you, Paul, Ken. I'm very flattered by those words. I uh, am myself uh, an opponent of the idea of heroes um, <laughs> on the grounds that uh, there's always the sense that the, the heroes are off doing impossibly great things that the rest of us can't do and therefore uh, in a way justifies our not doing anything. It, <laughs> It's a sort of anti-democratic ideal, and uh, so I wish, Ken, you would give my thanks to your friend and uh, tell her that uh, heroes, if they were ever here, are gone, and it's a good thing. <laughs> I'm very pleased to have been associated for a long time with uh, PSYCOP. Uh, I must say, uh, when the Skeptical Inquirer arrives, I uh, always take it uh, home from the office and uh, pour through the pages with some sense of delight about what new misunderstandings will be revealed <laughs> in, its, in its pages. I, I don't mean that, that, that the articles misunderstand, but they reveal misunderstandings. And uh, I'm, I'm always amazed that there's still another area that I've never thought of. Crop circles. It... <laughs> Aliens have come and made perfect circles and mathematical messages and so on in, in wheat. Who, who would have thought it? <laughs> or, or they've come and eviscerated cows. On a large scale, systematically. Farmers are furious. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just always impressed by the depths of inventiveness that the new, the new stories that are debunked in Skeptical Inquirer reveal. But then on more sober reflection, it seems to me that the stories are uh, fantastically unimaginative. That compared to the stunning, unexpected findings of science across the boards, they have a kind of uh, dreariness to them, a uh, lack of imagination, a uh, human 
chauvinism to them, a reflection of people who imagine that what pops into their head can be more stunning than what nature has already provided. And so in every case, uh, I always have this, this second thought about that's all they can imagine extraterrestrials doing, making circles in hay. <laughs> I want, in this talk, to cover some aspects of uh, the science, parascience, pseudoscience discussion, and uh, uh, I want to be sure to leave time for, for questions. There are microphones in the aisles. I always find that the question period is by far the most interesting, for me anyway, the most interesting part of the talk, because by and large I've often heard the talk before. <laughs> And so I hope you will uh, feel free to, uh, to uh, ask questions on anything that's, uh, that's on your mind, whether I've mentioned it or not in the talk, in the question period. If I can speak personally for a moment, uh, I, was, I was a child in a time of hope. I grew up when uh, the expectations for science were very high, 30s, 40s went to college in the early 50s, got my PhD in 1960. Um, there was uh, a sense of optimism about science and the future. Uh, I dreamt of being able to, to do science. It, uh, it came about, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I was a, a street kid, I mean, not homeless, I had a nice nuclear family, but I spent a lot of time in the streets as kids, as kids did then. And I knew everything. I knew every bush and hedge and street light and stoop and theater wall for playing Chinese handball and all that. But there was one aspect, for some reason, of that environment that uh, struck me as funny, as different, and that was the stars. Now, even with an early bedtime in winter, you could see stars. Okay, what were they? They weren't like hedges. They were different. And so I asked my friends what they were. And they said, there are lights in the sky, kid. <laughs> well, I could tell there were lights in the sky, but that wasn't an explanation. I mean, what were they? Little electric bulbs on long black wires, so you couldn't see what they were held up by. I mean, what were they? Not only could nobody tell me. But nobody even had the sense that that was an interesting question. They looked at me funny, you know. I asked my parents. I asked my parents' friends. I asked adults I knew. None of them knew. My mother said to me, look, we just got you a library card. Take this card, get on the streetcar, go to the New Utrecht branch of the New York Public Library, and get out a book and find the answer. That seemed to me a fantastically clever idea, <laughs> and so I did. I went there, I asked the librarian, I was very young, uh, I can't remember looking up, uh, for a book on stars. She said, sure, was gone a few minutes, brought one back, gave it to me. Eagerly, I sat down, opened the pages, and it was about uh, Veronica Lake. And <laughs> Gable. And, and so I went back and explained that it was not easy for me to do, that uh, that wasn't what I had in mind at all, that I meant like real stars. And she thought this was funny, which I, and I felt it humiliating. But anyway, she went and got the right kind of book. And I took that and opened it and slowly turned the pages until I came upon the answer. It was in there. It was stunning. The answer was that the sun was a star, except very far away. The stars were suns. If you were close to them, they would look just like our, our sun. And I remember I tried to imagine how far away from the sun you'd have to be for it to be as dim as a star. And I didn't know the inverse square law of light propagation. I had not the ghost of a chance of 
figuring it out. But it was clear to me that you'd have to be very far away. <laughs> Farther away probably than New Jersey. <laughs> and the idea of, of a universe vast beyond imagining swept over me. And uh, it stayed with me ever since. It was, it was an exhilarating feeling, a sense, which I later in life recognized, a sense of awe. And when later on, it took me several years to, to find this, I realized that we were on a planet, little, non-self-luminous, going around our star. And so all those other stars might have planets going around them, and if planets, then life, intelligence, Brooklyn's, who knew? <laughs> the diversity of those possible worlds, they didn't have to be exactly like, like ours, I was sure of it. Seemed to be the most stunning thing to, to study. And I didn't realize that you could be a professional scientist that had the idea that you'd have to, uh, you know, it'd have to be a, I don't know, salesman. And, and my father said that was better than the manufacturing end of things. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, would, I would do science weekends and evenings. It wasn't until my sophomore year in high school that my high school biology teacher revealed to me that there was such a thing as a professional scientist who got paid to do it so you could spend all your time doing it. It's a glorious day. <laughs> well, it's been my enormous good luck, just born in the right time, to have had to some extent, those childhood ambitions satisfied. I have been involved in the exploration of other worlds in, in the most amazing science fiction sense. We actually send spacecraft to other worlds. We fly by them, we orbit them, we land on them. We control the robots and make them do things, dig, and it digs. Determine the chemistry of that, and it determines the chemistry. And uh, for me, the the continuum from uh, childhood wonder and uh, early science fiction to uh, professional reality has been very smooth. It's never been, uh, oh gee, this is nothing like what I had imagined. Just the opposite. It's exactly like what I imagined. And so I, I feel enormously uh, fortunate about that. And science is still one of my chief joys. The popularization of science, the communication of not just the findings, but the methods of science, seems to me as a result uh, as natural as, as breathing. I mean, after all, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And so the idea that, uh, that scientists uh, shouldn't talk about their science seems to me bizarre. Now, there's another just speaking personally, another reason why, why I think popularizing science is important, why I try to do it. And it's a foreboding I have, uh, maybe ill-placed, of an America in my children's generation, or my grandchildren's generation, when all the manufacturing industries have uh, slipped away to other countries. Um, when we're a service and information processing economy. When awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few, and no one representing the public interest uh, can even grasp the issues. When the people, the, the people I mean the, the broad population in a democracy, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or even to knowledgeably question those who do set the agendas. When there is no practice in questioning those in authority. When clutching our crystals and religiously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in steep decline, unable to distinguish between what's true and what feels good. We slide almost without noticing into superstition and darkness. That worries me. 
And I don't think that uh, we have adequate protections against that. I don't think this is just a, a kind of uh, fantasy. Uh, there are reasons to worry. And you will recognize that uh, PSYCOP plays a sometimes lonely, but still, and in this case the word is right, heroic <laughs> role in trying to counter some of those trends. We have a civilization based on science and technology. And we've cleverly arranged things so that almost nobody understands science and technology. <laughs> now that is as clear a prescription for disaster as you can imagine. It's a combustible mixture of ignorance and power. And while we might get away with it for a while, that mixture, sooner or later, is going to blow up. The powers of modern technology are so enormous, I'll mention in a minute an example or two, that it's insufficient to, uh, to just say, well, those in charge of those powers, uh, I'm sure, are doing a good job. This is a democracy, and for us to make sure that the powers of science and technology are used properly and prudently, we ourselves must understand science and technology. The predictive powers of science, some areas of science at least, are, are awesome. And they are the clearest counter-argument, I can imagine, to those who say, oh, science is situational. Science is uh, just the current fashion. Uh, science is the promotion of the self-interests of those in power. Surely there is some of that. Surely if there's any powerful tool, those in power will try to use it or even monopolize it. Uh, surely scientists being people grow up in a certain society and reflect the prejudices in that society. How would we imagine it to be, to be different? So scientists have been nationalists, and scientists have been racists, and scientists have been sexists. But that doesn't undermine the validity of science. That's just a consequence of being human. So imagine so many areas we could think of. Imagine you wish to know the sex of your unborn child. Now there are several approaches. You could, for example, do what uh, the late film star, who Annie and I both admire greatly, uh, uh, Cary Grant, did uh, before he was in acting. And that is, in the carnival or fair, suspend a watch or a plumb bob above the abdomen of the expectant mother. And if it swings left to right, it's a boy, and if it swings forward back, it's a girl. And he got it right one time in two. <laughs> and of course, he was out of there before the baby was born, so there were never any, uh, any uh, angry customers who said he got it wrong. And being right one chance in two, that's not so bad. I mean, it's better than, say, Kremlinologists do. <laughs> But if you really want to know, then you go to amniocentesis or to um, sonograms. And there, your chance of being right is 99 out of 100. It's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than one out of two. If you really want to know, you go to science. Or suppose you wanted to know when the next eclipse of the sun is. Science does something really astonishing. It can tell you a century in advance where the eclipse is going to be on the earth and when totality to the fraction of a second. Think of the predictive power implied in that. Think of how much you must understand. To be able to say when there's going to be an eclipse so far in the future and where on the Earth. Or, and it's essentially the same physics exactly, imagine launching a spacecraft from the Earth, like the Voyager spacecraft in 1977. And 12 years later, 
Voyager 1 arrives at Neptune within 75 kilometers of where it was supposed to be, not having to use the mid-course corrections that were provided. 12 years, 5 billion kilometers on target. So, if you want to really be able to predict the future, not in everything, but in some areas, there's only one aspect of human scholarship, of human claims to knowledge, which really delivers the goods, and that's science. Religions would give their eye teeth to be able to predict anything like that well, and think of how much mileage they would make if they ever could, could do predictions like that by any method other than science. Now, how does it work? How come it's so successful? Science has built-in error correction mechanisms. Because science recognizes that scientists, like everybody else, are fallible. That we make mistakes, that we're driven by the same prejudices as everybody else. And so there is self-correcting machinery built into the structure of science. There are no forbidden questions. Arguments from authority are worthless. Claims must be demonstrated. Ad hominem arguments, arguments about the personality of somebody who disagrees with you are irrelevant. They can be sleazeballs and be right. And you can be a pillar of the community and you can be wrong. It's not, being a sleazeball does not guarantee that you're right. <laughs> but the correlations are very weak. <laughs> if you take a look at science in its everyday function, of course you find scientists run the gamut of human uh, emotions and personalities and character and so on. But there's one thing which is really striking to the outsider, and that is the gauntlet of criticism which is considered uh, common, de rigueur. So the poor graduate student at his or her PhD oral exam, subjected to a withering crossfire of questions which even sometimes seem hot, sometimes often seem hostile, from the professors who have PhD or failure in their grasp. And the students naturally are nervous, who wouldn't be? And they've prepared for it for years. But they understand that at that, that critical moment, they really have to be able to answer questions. They have to anticipate questions. They have to think of, where in my thesis is there a weakness that someone else might find, because I sure better find it before they do, because if they find it, and I'm not prepared, I'm in deep trouble. You take a look at scientific meetings with people yelling at each other and, and the chairman trying to call for order. You find the university colloquia in which the poor speaker has hardly gotten 30 seconds to present what she or he is saying. And uh, suddenly there's questions, interruptions from the audience. You take a look at the publication conventions in which you submit a scientific paper to a journal and it goes out to anonymous referees whose job it is to say, did you do anything stupid? If you didn't do anything stupid, is there anything in here that is sufficiently interesting to be published? What are the deficiencies of this paper? Has it been done by anybody else? Is the argument adequate or should you resubmit the paper after you've done the actual work that you are here speculating on? And so on. And it's anonymous. You don't know who it is. You have to rely on the editor to send it out to, to uh, experts who are not too cruel. This is the everyday expectation in the scientific community. And those who don't expect it, even good scientists who just can't hold up to the criticism, are in deep trouble. Why do we put up with it? 
is that we like to be criticized? No, no scientist likes to be criticized. Every scientist feels an affection for his or her ideas and scientific results, like children. And somebody attacks them, you feel protective. Wait a minute, wait a minute, this is a really good idea. Don't, don't attack it. But that's not the way it goes. The idea is that the ideas that don't work, throw them away. Don't waste any neurons on what doesn't work. Devote those neurons to new ideas that better explain the data. Be willing to surrender your own ideas. There is a reward structure in science which is very interesting, which is that our highest rewards go to those who disprove the doctrines of the most revered scientists. There's a bonus for proving the greatest among us wrong. So Einstein is revered not just because he made so many fundamental contributions to science, but because he found something that Isaac Newton missed. And Isaac Newton, surely the greatest physicist before Albert Einstein. Now think of what other areas of human society have such a reward structure in which we revere those who prove that the fundamental doctrines that we have assumed are wrong. Think of it in politics. Think of it in economics. Think of it in religion. Think of it in how we organize the society. It's exactly the opposite. There we reward those who reassure us that what we've been told is really right and don't have any concerns about it. And that's why we've made, or it's at least a fundamental reason why, we've made so much progress in science and so little in these other areas. Another key aspect of science is experiments. We experiment. Scientists do not trust what is intuitively obvious because intuitively obvious gets you nowhere. That the Earth is flat was once obvious. I mean, really, obvious, obvious. Go out in a flat field and take a look. Is it round or flat? Just, you know, don't listen to me. Go prove it yourself. <laughs> that heavier bodies fall faster than light ones was once obvious. That blood-sucking leeches cured disease was once obvious. That some people are naturally and by divine right slaves was once obvious. That the earth is at the center of the universe was once obvious. You're skeptical? Go out, take a look. Stars rise in the east, set in the west. Here we are, stationary. We see them going around us. We're at the center. They go around us. The truth may be puzzling. It may take some work to get to. It may be counterintuitive. It may contradict deeply held prejudices. It may not be consonant with what we desperately want to be true. But we are not the measure of what's true. We have a method, and that method helps us determine not absolute truth, only asymptotic approaches to the truth, never there, just closer and closer, uh, always finding vast new oceans of undiscovered possibilities when we have made tiny forays into the island on this great sea of unknowing. Experiment, cleverly designed experiments are the key. Many decades ago, uh, in the 20s, there was a dinner at which the physicist Robert W. Wood was asked to respond to a toast. This is the time when people got up, made a toast, then said, okay, now you respond. And nobody knew what they'd be asked to respond to, so it was a uh, challenge to quick-wittedness. And in this case, the toast was to physics and metaphysics. 
Now, by metaphysics, it was meant uh, something like uh, philosophy. Um, truths that you could get to just by thinking about them. Wood took a second, glanced around him, and answered along these lines. He said, the physicist has an idea. The more he thinks it through, the more sense it makes to him. He goes to the scientific literature, and the more he reads, the more promising does the idea seem. Thus prepared, he devises an experiment to test the idea. The experiment is painstaking. Many possibilities are checked. Sources of error and noise are suppressed. The accuracy of the measurement is refined. At the end of all this work, the experiment is done, and the idea is shown to be worthless. The physicist then discards the idea, frees his mind, as I was saying a moment ago, from the clutter of error, and moves on to something else. The difference between physics and metaphysics, Wood concluded, is that the metaphysicist has no laboratory. <laughs> We are fallible. We cannot foist our wishes on the universe. Let me say just a little bit again, just recap and, and maybe another couple of points about why is it so important to, uh, to have widely distributed understanding of science and technology. For one thing, it is the golden road out of poverty for developing nations. And developing nations understand that. Because you have only to look at modern American graduate schools in mathematics, in engineering, in physics, to find in case after case more than half the students are from other countries. I think this is, this is good. This is something America is doing for the world. But it is a clear sense that the developing nations understand what is essential for, uh, for their future. What worries me is that we may not be so clear on the same subject. Another aspect has to do with the dangers of technology. If you, uh, it, it's astonishing that almost every astronaut in low Earth orbit has made this point. I was up there, they say, and I looked towards the horizon, and there was this thin blue band that was the Earth's atmosphere. I had been told we live in an ocean of air, and there it is, so fragile, such a delicate blue, I was worried for it. In fact, the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere compared to the size of the Earth, is in about the same ratio as the thickness of a coat of shellac on a schoolroom globe is to the size of the globe. Now that's the air that nurtures us and almost all the life on Earth, that protects us from deadly ultraviolet light from the sun, that uh, through the greenhouse effects brings the surface temperature of the Earth above the freezing point without the greenhouse effect, the entire Earth would be plunged 10 or more degrees below the freezing point of water, and we'd all be dead. Now that atmosphere, so thin and fragile, is under assault by our technology. We're pumping all kinds of stuff up into it. And you know about the concern that chlorofluorocarbons are depleting the ozone layer, which uh, certainly is the case, and that the carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases are producing global warming, a steady trend amidst fluctuations produced by volcanic eruptions and other sources, and who knows what other challenges to the atmosphere that we haven't been wise enough to foresee yet. Now, this is an area and there are many like it, but this is one that I've been working on, and so I'm 
sort of concentrating on, in which the inadvertent side effects of technology, nothing we intend to do, the side effects can challenge the environment on which our very lives depend. Now that means that we must understand science and technology, we must understand in a very clever way long-term consequences, not just what's tomorrow, not just the bottom line on the profit and loss column for the corporation for this year, but 10, 20, 50, 100 years in the future. The time scales that we have to think are different. If we absolutely stop all chlorofluorocarbon and, and allied chemical production right now, the ozonosphere will heal itself about a hundred years from now. And therefore, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren must suffer through the mistakes that we've made. That's a second reason. Dangers of technology, we must understand them better. Third reason, origins. Every human culture has devoted some of its intellectual, moral, and how shall I say, poetic resources into trying to understand where we come from. We, our particular group, us humans, the planet, the stars, the sun, the universe, where does it come from? What is it all? Where is it going? Now we happen through no merit of ours, just by sheer luck, to be alive at a time when the answers to these questions are beginning to be revealed. These are goosebump questions. These are questions that you've got to be made of wood not to be at least a little interested in. Let me say uh, a word about science and pseudoscience. I think there's a kind of uh, Gresham's law that applies here, in which the bad science drives out the good in the popular imagination. And what I mean is this. Um, if you are awash in lost continents and channeling and UFOs and uh, all the long litany of claims so well exposed in the skeptical inquirer, you may not have intellectual room for the findings of science. Your wonder quotient is fully occupied. There hasn't been room for science to sneak in. The culture in one way produces these fantastic findings of science and then in another way cuts them off before they reach the average person. And so people who are curious, intelligent, dedicated to understanding the world may nevertheless be, in our view, admired in superstition and pseudoscience. And you could say, well, they ought to know better, they ought to be more critical, and so on, but that's too harsh. It's not very much their fault, I say. It's the fault of a society that preferentially propagates one set of things and holds to a very small community another set of things. The last way for skeptics to get the attention of these bright, curious, interested people is to belittle or condescend or to show arrogance towards their beliefs. They are not stupid. It's a problem not, it's a problem of the society more than anything else. And if we bear in mind human frailty and fallibility we will have compassion for them. So, for example, I have lately been thinking a lot about uh, alien abductions and false claims of childhood sexual abuse 
and claims of uh, satanic uh, ritual abuse in the context of recovered memories and so on. I think there's a lot of uh, similarities, interesting similarities between those cases. I think uh, if we are to understand any of them, we must understand all of them. But there's one thing about it that worries me, and that is the tendency, sometimes explicitly, more often implicitly, to say, all these claims of childhood sexual abuse are, uh, are silly and pumped up by unethical therapists and uh, all of that. Well, in yesterday's paper, a survey of 13 states reports that one-sixth of all the rape victims reported to police are under the age of 12. And this is a category of rape that is preferentially under-reported to police for obvious reasons. Of these girls, one-fifth were raped by their fathers. Now that's a lot of betrayal. That's a lot of people. And we have to bear that in mind when we approach people who say they have an eating disorder and their psychiatrist convinced them that they were abused in childhood. It does not follow that they're wrong because the logic seems strained. A lot of people have been sexually abused by parents or those who served in loco parentis. People are not stupid. They believe things for reasons. Let me give another example. In the 19th century, it was uh, mediums. You'd go there and they would uh, put you in touch with dead relatives. Uh, these days, it's a little different. It's called channeling. But the basic and spiritualism was, I guess, back in the 19th century, part of the medium business. What this is basically about is attempting to deal with human fear of dying. And I don't know about you guys. I find the idea of dying unpleasant. <laughs> I would just as soon not die. I recognize I have to. In fact, twice in my life I came very close to doing so. I did not have a near-death experience. Sorry to say. Um, but I can understand anxiety about dying. About um, 12 to 14 years ago, both my parents died. We had a very good relationship. I was very close to them. Uh, I still miss them terribly. And uh, I wouldn't ask much. I would sort of like, you know, five minutes a year. Tell them how the kids and the grandchildren are doing and how Annie and me are doing. And I know it sounds stupid, but I'd like to ask them, you know, is everything all right with you? Uh, just, just a little, a little contact. For that reason, I do not guffaw at uh, women who go to their husband's tombstones and give them a chat every now and then. I can understand that. That's not hard to understand. And if we have difficulties on the ontological status of who it is they're talking to, that's all right. That's not what this is about. This is about humans being human. Um, in the alien abduction context, I've, I've been trying to uh, understand and talk up the idea that humans hallucinate, that it's a common part of, uh, of human nature. Yes, under conditions of sensory deprivation or drugs or uh, deprival of REM sleep, but also just in the ordinary course of, of existence. I have, maybe a dozen times since my parents died, heard one of them say, my name. Just single first word, Carl. I'm not surprised by it. I miss them. They called me by my first name so much during the time they were alive. It had great psychic roots. So my brain plays it back every now and then. It doesn't surprise me at all. I sort of like it. But it is a hallucination. And if I was a little less skeptical, I could see how easy it would be to say, ooh, 
Where, where are they? They're, they're, they're here somewhere. I can hear them. Raymond Moody, who is uh, an MD, I think, an author who spends lots of time uh, writing innumerable books on uh, life after death, actually quoted me in the first chapter of his latest book, saying that I, you know, I heard my parents calling me Carl, saying, look, even he believes in life after death. <laughs> missing the whole point. And if this is one of the arguments from chapter one of the latest book of the principal exponent of this, I don't think he has a good case. But still, but still, suppose I wasn't steeped in, uh, in the virtues of scientific skepticism and felt the same way about my parents. And along comes somebody who says, I can put you in touch with them. And suppose they're smart, and they found out something about uh, my parents in the past, and they're good at uh, faking voices and so on, darkened room and incense and all of that. I could see being really swept away emotionally. That's not hard to understand. Now, would you think less of me in that case if I had no background in skepticism, no idea of why it's a virtue, but had the sense that it was grumpy and negative and rejecting everything that was uh, humane. Wouldn't you think that, uh, that there's something wrong with rejecting my openness to the medium con man or woman? What I'm trying to say is that the one deficiency which I see in the skeptical movement is an us versus them. A sense that we have a monopoly on the truth. Those other people who believe in all these stupid doctrines are morons and uh, they're, uh, or worse. And uh, that's it. If you're sensible, you listen to us. If not, to hell with you. That is non-constructive. That does not get our message across. That condemns us to permanent minority status. Whereas, an approach which from the beginning acknowledges the human roots of these problems, understands that the society has arranged things so that skept for very good reasons, that skepticism is not well taught. By very good reasons, I mean very good reasons for the protection of those in power. If skepticism is well understood, then who is the skepticism going to be applied to except those in power? Those in power do not have a vested interest in everybody being able to ask searching questions. <laughs> if, um, if we understand that, then we have compassion to the abductees and those who startled come upon the crop circles and believe that they are supernatural, and then we have a much better chance of, uh, of succeeding. I think it is key for us to make science and the scientific method more attractive, especially to the young because that's a battle for the future. And as I look through this audience, I see a very nice mixed distribution of ages, I, which I think is a very positive and hopeful sign. The sign of a dying cult is everybody is as old as I am. <laughs> Now, science involves an amazing, seemingly self-contradictory mix. On the one hand, it requires an almost complete openness to all ideas, no matter how bizarre and weird they sound. As I walk along, my time slows down, I shrink in the direction of motion, and I get more massive, excuse me, Ken. That's crazy. On the scale of the very small, the molecule can be in that position, in that position, 
but it is prohibited from being in any intermediate position. That's wild. But the first is special relativity, the second is quantum mechanics, and like it or not, that's the way the world is. And if you only say, well, that's ridiculous, you will be forever closed to the major findings of science. On the other hand, science requires the most vigorous and uncompromising skepticism. Because the vast majority of ideas are simply wrong. And the only way you can distinguish the right from the wrong, the wheat from the chaff, is by testing. It is no fun, as I said at the beginning, to be on the receiving end of the testing. But it is the penalty we pay for having so powerful a tool as science.